Whenever you're ready, Whit. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Rabb al-Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iyaka na'abadu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihtina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Adhina al-Amta alayhim. Ghair maghdubi alayhim. Wala dalim. Today, I want to focus on a particular hadith, a hadith kudzi, which means that it is a, a revelation from God, but not one that is included in the Quran. It is different from other hadith in that they come directly from God. They're not sayings of Muhammad. Here is the hadith. I was a hidden treasure and I longed to be known. Therefore, I created the creation in order to be known. Many believe this hadith is a forgery, or at least weak. It does not come with an isnad, a chain, chain of transmission, though this is actually normal for a hadith qudzi. The famous scholar Ibn Taymiyyah believed that it was a forgery, but he also said that it is fully consistent with Islamic theology. The hidden treasure hadith is very popular among Sufis, two of the greatest in the Sufi tradition, Rumi and Ibn Arabi, have a great deal to say about it. Particularly, Ibn Arabi uses it to explore or explain met metaphysics. You may be relieved to know that I have no intention to talk about metaphysics. I'm not sure I know much about metaphysics. But what strikes me about this hadith is that God wants us to be familiar with him. God wants to be known. God longs for us to be familiar with him. God loves the idea of us knowing him. God does not want to be hidden. We should not want to be God to be hidden because God is a treasure. The Hadith goes on to say that the way God resolved this desire to be known is to create, to create the creation. In other words, to create everything. Everything that God creates serves to make God known to us. In the very first revelation of the Quran, God announces that he is a creator. Surat al-Iqra begins, Iqra, bismi rabbika, alladhi khalak, khalak al-insan, min alak. Recite in the name of your Lord who created created humanity out of a clot. Notice that God's act of creating is mentioned twice in immediate succession. The effect is to emphasize from the very beginning of the period of revelation, from the first two verses of the first revelation, that God is a creator. The common interpretation is that the first halak refers to God's creation of everything, and the second chalak refers specifically to God's creation of humanity. In both cases, in the beginning of time, God created. Even this is only part of the story. In Surat al-Rahman, we read, Kul yawm huwa fi shan. Every day, God is about something. Every day, God is at work. Every day, God is still creating. So we do not accept the idea of the deus ex machina, the idea that God winds the clock and then lets it go, creates a machine, and the world ticks on of its own accord. No, every day, God is doing the work of creating and recreating. God was the creator, and God is the creator. 
And one reason for this, according to this hadith, is because God wants to be known. We should not, of course, understand this in the same way that we might want to be known. We might want acclamation or admiration. We might want to be known in order to prop up our self-esteem. We might want to think that in order to be recognized as treasure or something worthwhile, our value needs to be documented. But the treasure that is God needs no acclamation. God has no need of self-esteem or admiration. The treasure that God is, is all-encompassing. It is the treasure of all that is beautiful, all that is wise, all that is just, all that is peace. It is a treasure with a purpose, the purpose being to show us the straight path, the path that leads us towards beauty, wisdom, justice, and peace, God's treasure. There are two aspects I want to focus on. One is the revelation and God's creation, and the other is the practice of noticing. The first is articulated in Surat al Ikra. God created, created the world and created humanity. Throughout the Quran, the creation is cited as evidence of God's beneficence and God's presence and God's reality. One of my favorite images is from Surat al-Nal, the 79th verse. Do they not see the birds poised in the midst of the sky? Nothing holds them up but God. Truly in this are signs for those who believe. I love the specificity of this. One translation has nothing holds them up but the hand of God. We may admire the grandeur of the mountains, the power of the seas, but to notice the wonder of a bird, not just flying, but seemingly floating in air as if suspended from a thread from heaven. So ordinary and yet so wonderful. Or another is the image of the spider in the 41st verse of Surat al-Ankabut, building the frailest of houses, so delicate, and yet we know it is strong. It is a wonder. It may seem less so if you accidentally run into it, but I remember as a child coming out of our house in the morning and walking by where we store our trash bins, and there was an enormous spider web stretched out over the trash bay. Every thread sparkled with dew, and the spider itself so perfectly centered in the web, so still and waiting was streaked with black and the most brilliant yellow. 60 years later or more, it is fresh in my mind, as if it was yesterday. Knowing this, seeing these, we celebrate this world spread before us as a banquet and the immense treasure that it is. And with this is the marvel that is humanity, each other, the communities in which we live and move, and the billions unknown to us, each going about their business, their own business of creating. In all that we see, God is made known. Even in the sorrowful of that which is not beauty, of which there is far too much in our world, we can see evidence of God. The absence of God also makes God known. When God is hidden from us, that which is beautiful becomes drab, that which is wise becomes unenlightened, that which is just becomes selfish, and that which is peace dissolves to turmoil.
and we see what happens when God is ignored, when we are hidden from God. And in that knowledge, in that realization, God is revealed. So we see not only the vastness of God's creation, but also the immediacy of it, the continuity, the daily continuity of it. Every day, God is doing something to create the opportunity for us to know God. But only if we are paying attention. All this can be unfolding all around us. But if we do not pause to see, if we do not notice, then God and God's treasure remain unknown. And God's purpose of revelation, God's purpose of creation is diminished. I want to draw here from a Christian practice, or at least a practice that I know in its Christian form. It would not surprise me if it is also an established Islamic practice or Jewish practice or in some other tradition. It is called the examen. The point of it is to notice, to pay attention, to see what thing God is about. So at night, when dark and silence envelop you, you ask yourself, three questions. The first is, where was God most present today? As you think back on the hours since awakening, where did God seem to come out of hiding for a moment to reveal some treasure, some gift, some wonder? It may not necessarily have been something very welcome to you, but it is nevertheless a treasure, because it comes from God. It comes from love. The next question is the converse. Where was God most absent? When was God hiding? The hiddenness of God may be God's choice. We know that God hardens the heart from time to time. We know that God may make us blind or deaf according to God's will for God's mysterious purpose. And even in blindness and deafness, we see, we feel, we are become aware of the importance of seeing and the importance of hearing. So blindness and deafness are both revelatory. But it may be more likely that the absence of God is not the doing of God, but our own doing and our own undoing. We turn away. We are distracted. Even we are, when we are prostrate in prayer, we can be absent and God is hidden. God's treasure is unknown. It is important to notice these times and to ponder the cause and effect. Why did I not feel God's presence? It is normal not to feel God's presence much of the time. We're immersed in the work of every day. But why does my recollection, my moment of asking this question, go to this particular time when God was most absent? What does that tell me about the way I am living my life? In the past couple of weeks, I've been packing, getting ready to move to New Jersey sometime this winter to live upstairs from our daughter and her family. It will be wonderful being close to family, seeing my granddaughters every day, Elsie, who's five, and Clara, who's eight. I'll show you the pictures later. And living for the first time in my life in the dense richness of a real city, but I'm anxious. I don't know what my life will be like up there. What will I be doing? I'm a teacher, but who am I? What am I doing if I'm not teaching? I'm a scholar, 
who am I and what am I doing if I'm not doing scholarship? Will I still teach a course somehow? What books should I take? What files? What will fit? Even now, I'm tempted to go back and open a box to retrieve some volume that I think I might really need or regret throwing some articles away. I'm anxious. And in those moments, the treasure of God's peace is absent. So there is the third question. What intention do I now form for this coming day? What do I learn from the first two questions? And what learning do I carry forward? And how? How do I today still that unease? What have I learned from yesterday? Truly in the remembrance of God do hearts find rest, says the Quran. But how do I find that rest? Remembrance, noticing God wishes to be known. God's treasure and the treasure that is God awaits us every day. So every day we must be about the work of remembrance. Asking the questions, where was God present? Where was God absent? What does this tell me? Remembering to look for the signs of God's presence and the signs of God's absence in order that we may find God's treasure of beauty, justice, wisdom, and peace. May it be so. Thank you.